Hey there, listeners and viewers. A couple of notes about the next few episodes, which I am titling a series called Interviews Around the House. So recently, I was talking to Josh Mailerman. I knew his book, Incidents Around the House, was coming out. And so I said, hey, you're only like a five-hour drive away. Why don't I just come up and we can talk in person? I'll grab a hotel for the night, whatever. we just hang out. And then, you know, I'll crash there and head home the next day. And he said, yeah, that sounds like a cool idea, but you can crash with me if you want. And so that was the starting of an idea. And so I packed up a bunch of equipment, audio equipment, and <laughs> headed up to Josh's house. And Josh and Allison were nice enough to let me crash at their place. And I spent a couple of nights there. And over the course of a few days, me and Josh recorded about five hours of audio. We talked about incidents around the house. We talked about the documentary he made. We talked about... Um, the importance of, of archiving the process of creativity, especially when it comes to books. So lots of topics. I got to do a lot of cool stuff. So we went and played pool one night with him and his friends. I got to see his band, The High Strung, uh, rehearse for an upcoming gig. Um, another interesting thing that happened is that Josh is planning a stage performance for the release of Incidents Around the House. And so I got to attend when all of... The group called Wow Town got together to do a rehearsal for their stage performance for Incidents Around the House. I got to be there for that. I recorded that. It was really neat. I watched Josh's documentary. A lot of stuff happened. We had a really great time over the course of a few days. And I captured about five hours of audio. And so that's why we're calling this series Interviews Around the House. Because um, parts of the interview were hanging out in his kitchen listening to records and stuff. Parts of the interview were sitting out on his deck, hanging out in nature, talking, and parts of the interview were just randomly kind of bombing around the property inside, outside, after having some drinks and, and talking about really interesting stuff. So five hours of audio is probably going to end up being a solid three episodes of about an hour long each on a variety of topics. The first episode is going to be the episode that you're going to hear today. And that's going to include, instead of the usual, I have the author tell the listeners what the book is about. I clipped from the recording of the Incidents Around the House performance rehearsal. I clipped the part where Josh is introducing the audience to the story of Incidents Around the House. And I'm going to use that as a way to set up our conversation about the book. So after I get done talking here, you'll hear Josh in that live performance where he's explaining what the book is. There's cool music in the background and everything. He'll explain what the book is, and then you'll hear our conversation out on his deck about the book, Incidents Around the House. Just as a heads up, because we were outside and it was just a digital recorder sitting on a table, sometimes there's going to be a little bit of wind interference that makes some of it a little bit tougher to understand. But for the most part, it should be a nice experience where you're hearing birds and there's even tree frogs and stuff um, in the background while uh, we're talking. And it's usually pretty clear. There's just a few moments where it gets a little bit garbled. So apologies for that. But overall, all of the conversations were fantastic. And I'm looking forward to sharing multiple episodes of this cool experience with Josh. So next, what you're going to hear is Josh introducing the concept of incidents around the house from that recorded a rehearsal that I mentioned, and then we'll go into the conversation on the deck where we talk about incidents around the house. Welcome to Incidents Around the House, ladies and gentlemen. Finally solved my limited vocabulary problem by writing a story narrated by a girl. <laughs> I was able to finally toss the foot source aside and use every word that is natural to me. <laughs> and every word that I actually know. For the first time in my life, this book fully represents me. This is the story of eight-year-old Bella, who will be narrated by the eight-year-old disabilities. <laughs> Bella lives with Mommy, Dado, and there's something else in the house, too, that Bella calls other Mommy. Other Mommy, every time, I, I'll, I'll work this out, every time Other Mommy Whatever, daily, whatever it is. She has a question for Bella. Can I go into your heart? And Bella isn't quite sure how to respond, but the longer she takes this to respond, the more bold other mommy is getting. And then 
And that is where the book begins. Where all the mommy is starting to get a little bold by getting that answer from Bella to the question, can I go into your heart? All right, I'm wanted in the closet right now. But I'll leave you with one word. Enjoy. The one thing that struck me in the middle of writing incidents was that, and again, I want to stress that not trying to write weird for weird's sake, but we've seen many times the possession story where maybe like the man, the woman, the kid, whatever it is, is a little scared of something in the house or whatever, and then the person is possessed, and now we have to deal with that for the rest of the book, right? right. That rest yeah. of the story. At some point, I realized with incidents around the house that this was putting a magnifying glass up to the entity's attempt to get in. So yeah. the entire book is predicated upon, can I go into your heart? The question that, for listeners, that other mommy asks, eight-year-old Bella. And Bella pretty much keeps, you know, either saying no or not answering. And when the book begins, we're already at a spot where other mommy is starting to be sort of frustrated by this. Right. Right. So what maybe starts as, I wouldn't say it started as friends, but maybe started as like a more sort of easygoing, like, hi, Bella, who are you? You know, blah, blah. And it has now led to other mommies starting to get a little bolder, more aggressive. And then as the book goes on, like way bolder, way more aggressive. So yeah, I think that's a good place to start. If you do, is that the whole book is really, if you think about it, it's a very small idea that is the whole novel, which is the entity's attempt to get in. That's the whole freaking arc. Right. Because, and you had said earlier, when we were talking before this, that you don't really see that part of it. It's the part that's not explored because the part that we typically see is the actual possession and overcoming the possession and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's, I, it's funny that you would think someone would have thought of that already. And maybe, maybe they have, we just, yeah, maybe. Like, yeah, yeah. In, um, in Ghoul in the Cape, there's a novella called Liberty in Pieces. That is, so France gifted us the Statue of Liberty, right? And we always think like, oh, it was set up there first, mm. then it was brought down, and then they brought it here. And then you think for a second, you're like, but wait a minute, so you're telling me that the Statue of Liberty was separated and in, at one point in time separated and in pieces on a barge or barges in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean? Yeah. <laughs> so it's fun to imagine the giant head on a barge yeah. or, the, or the torch or whatever and this aerial view and this night time of the Statue of Liberty being shipped here. Same thing. It's a part of the story that is easy to just overlook. They gave it to us. They brought it here. Yep. But wait, wait, hold on. What does that mean they brought it here? Right. Like, what's, what happened there right, on the right. bringing it here? Same thing here. The thing is trying in a different story you know the thing possesses someone. Oh, okay but how long did that take to happen? Mm. And what exactly went down to get inside. Right, right. Because if, it, I mean, why couldn't an entity just like step right in and just step right into yeah. someone? Yep. Or is there some work involved? Is there some cunning involved? Is there some, is there an invitation needed? Yep. Is there whatever it is? So, yeah. Well, I think too, when we were talking about Spin of Black Yarn, we were talking about ghost stories or haunted houses. And I brought up the topic of you know, when you're watching a haunted house movie, eventually you come to the idea of like, why don't they just leave? Yeah. And so you, you kind of address that idea in the book too. I don't know if that's a spoiler or not. Like, no, I don't think so. I think that's but fine. Yeah. The idea of ha hauntings might not necessarily be to the house, but maybe more to the people. Or yeah. Something. Yeah. The, so like, these, this family definitely tries to leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, yeah. And that's cool too, because if you can't just leave the thing, Either you're stuck with it forever, and now this is your life, or you have to figure out what to do about it, right? Yeah. Which yeah. leads me to one of my favorite things about this book, is how nobody fucking knows what to do. And we talked about that yeah. before, about how, I think in real, realistic terms, if that happened to me tomorrow, what would I do? What would I realistically like, what do? Would, like, okay, well, let, let's ask, what would you do? If yeah. you walked in to one of the kids' rooms, and you saw other mommies sitting on the end of the bed, talking in your voice, yeah. and, and the kids on the bed listening as if listening to you. What, literally, what would you do other than grab the kid and run like a madman? What would you do? It'd almost be even scary to grab the kid because, I mean, you have to get closer to the thing on the end of the bed. Yeah. I mean, I, it, would, it would be such a... It's funny because we're not looking for realism, right? I, I mean, I'm not. 
Meanwhile, that's a very realistic thread through incidents around the house. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. hyper-realistic is that nobody nobody knows any more than even Bella does. Yeah. And like you said in the car, in a weird way, Bella's kind of the, the biggest expert right. of the, the bunch, expert. and she, she doesn't fucking know what to do. So yeah, it's like, she's the one that's been interacting with yes. Mommy the whole time. It has a sense of the mood or the spirit of Mommy. Yeah. Or yeah. Right. Temperament. Um, yeah. At the same time, she's a child, so she doesn't understand the world. Yeah. But then I'm reading through the book, and part of me is like, is that helping the situation that she doesn't understand? Because the moment I or you would be confronted with that situation, immediately I'd think, who do I go to? And it would be the police. It would be shows up in the book ghost hunters or priest or something like that and what are they gonna what are they gonna do what are they gonna do man what are they gonna fucking do <laughs> like what is a ghost hunter <laughs> gonna do for you and then they even have their you know friend lois with the crystals and yeah but i mean i would go to all those people too like my friend john tenney is an occultist here and i would absolutely go to him yeah and what, what would john be able to do man if if that thing was literally in the house yeah and that's so, I mean, and also, also not just that, like, not just a sense of the thing, like you're seeing it yeah. in the house. Like and, you actually, this, right. you saw it, like right. y'all saw it, yeah. Right, and that changes everything when, I think I originally had, I, I don't think this is a spoiler for listeners, that, because it's kind of part of the point too, is that this book is not about Bella trying to convince her parents of this thing. This, this book is not about people not believing the kid and there is something about the parents see the thing fairly early on. That, that's a yeah. that's a part that is baked into the book is that everyone here has seen it, and so like we're all trying to deal with the like what do we do with it? Nobody's like, all right, if you say so, you know. No, it's like, oh Jesus, man, I saw it too. What do we do? Yeah, there's that one beat of the adults being like, oh, it's cute. She says other mommy. It's this imaginary friend. That doesn't last long at all. That does like, not last long. That. When she's in the Almost doctor's office, is overcome, yeah. and the doctor's like, other oh, mommy? Like, what's this, you know? Yeah. And then I think mommy starts to answer. He's like, no, 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 I, I would like Bella to tell you. Like, you know? Yeah. You're like, what is this you're talking about? Oh, what about when dad was like, how many times have you seen her? And Bella's like, I don't know. And then dad was like, like a hundred? And she goes, yeah, maybe. And you're like, oh, no. Yeah, like, oh, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, and as a parent, which I'm not a parent, but I have to imagine that how much do you feel like you failed your child if this thing that you is unfathomably, unfathomably like horrifying has been interacting with your child for like weeks, months? Yeah, yeah I'm going like, what do you think it is? Months? It feels like months, feels like right? Months, yeah, it feels yeah. like months. Yeah, not like, years. It feels like months. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because you got to think of like the timeline of the mind of a child. Yep. If it was definitely like, months is a very fucking long time. Yeah, months yeah. is a real long time. Yeah. But months is enough time for that number of interactions to happen. Yeah. You know, 90 days or whatever, 120 days. Yeah, like she, she's seen it every day. And that's another thing, too. It's like, oh, God. When you see, like, the video of the snake that falls through the roof of the... Yeah. Or if somebody <laughs> lifts something in a house and there's a giant spider. This whole time, other mommy, what do you mean? This thing's been in... Like, forget Bella for one second. This thing's been in my house for yeah. six months or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, dude. What about when Dado is with Bella in Bella's bathroom and he's like, oh boy, wow. Right. And yeah, he and smells something. Yeah, he's like, yeah. oh, Bella, man. He's like, we got to clean in here or whatever. Yeah, like yeah. That. Because that's an adult mind, too, is like, we're going to find the most logical explanation for what's going on. Yeah. You wouldn't naturally go to, oh, there's an actual monster living in my yeah. daughter's bathroom. But yeah, yeah 100%. I, I like how the boldness of other mommy kind of evolved pretty quickly, too. Like, in the very beginning, it was, you saw through Bella's perspective that it started out really innocent. Like, is it okay if I come out of the closet? Might like, you like me better in here? Yeah. Or is it fine yeah. if I come out? Or, yeah. But then, so early on, the parents have a party where, like, I have a bunch of friends over. And, and one of the partygoers sees other mommy. And, like, that's just pandemonium kind of at that moment. Yeah. But then that was the first time we understood that other mommy came downstairs, I think. Yep. And yep. So, right. At yeah. that point, we're like, this isn't just in a girl's closet. Right. Right. This thing is and not only that, too. this was, I think Marsha's the only one that saw her in that moment. But can you imagine that scene in a movie of like, it's a party and like people, and then Marsha like looks over, two people sort of separate and other mommies like standing against the wall looking back at her or something like, yeah. oh man, would that be good? Yeah. There yeah. are like so many moments in this book that would just, if it's just let it be what it is yeah. and just do it a little underhanded, a little understated and... 
oh god it could be so chilling yeah and that's what I think about like one of the things that we talked about Mike Flanagan separately like last night and I think one of the things that he does so well is not putting the scare but not like rubbing your nose in it uh-huh. like, yep totally with, um, the haunting of Hill House sometimes you didn't even realize the ghost was in the background unless yeah. you were like really paying attention but if you were paying attention and you saw that thing it was like holy shit like it yeah. was so effective because he didn't say it's a ghost now it was just like some creepy shit's happening if you if you you know are good and there's like a subconscious thing to that too right even if you're not aware of even if you didn't see it yeah there's some part of something's you as off. just a, a person yeah. that views and recognizes that something's off and I don't even know what it is. Like, this conversation seems unsettling. Well, actually, there's a, a, a ghost that you haven't quite yeah. noticed in the background here watching you watch yeah. this. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm huge on that. I, we, were ta- we, we talked about Paul Tremblay earlier with just a brilliant, that deft hand of the underlying dread. Yep. I think Dathan Arbach is like that. We were talking about Sarah Gran, Come Closer is like that. Oh, yeah. Um, Pen Pal is for sure like that. Um... Another one is Andrew Michael Hurley. The Loney is like that. That, that That's my favorite stuff. I, and I think... <clears throat> I don't know that Poe does it quite like that because his is more like manic and, and stuff. And I don't know that Lovecraft does either. I I don't think Stephen King does either. Yeah. I, I, maybe here and there he does or something or there's moments of it. But that just that undercurrent of dread. Where, oh, you know what You know what does it? Uh, I'm thinking of ending things, Ian Reid. Did you read that one? No. So, okay. The first half of the book is just like a car ride, two people talking, and it's just the whole time. It's just like, oh, God, this, this, this <laughs> sense underneath, this beneath, yeah. the beneath the story vibe that is just like, oh, and that's always been my favorite stuff, and I feel like, I, I know Incidents is a little more overt, but I feel like it's here also. Well, it's funny that this is the topic, because the thing that I immediately go to is Bird Box, because like, the thing that I thought about with Bird Box was... I constantly felt anxious the whole time I was yeah. in that book. The this trilling kind of like anxiety was through the whole thing consistently. And so when I would recommend the book to people, I'd be like, "This is a great book if you don't mind just being freaked out the whole time." <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, reading good. It. So like that's that kind of thing too, where it's just like a baseline that's unrelenting. I think Bird Box is one of the better examples of that too. Yeah. Awesome. You know, I th- I thank you, and that's freaking amazing. I think that incidents is like. If you're regularly putting out books and your body of work is getting bigger and this kind of thing, I think, I don't know if this happens for everyone or not, but I feel like incidents is like a landmark moment for me in my career, not in a, I'm not talking about a sales or any of that way. We have no idea. It hasn't come out yet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. But I mean, in terms of, it's balanced something out for me. There's the the colorful, ornate, unmarried Carol, Goblin, Ghoul in the Cape. Even Gasoline Yule, uh, where things are like, and I'm not saying those books aren't scary or don't have scary. I mean, in fact, I kind of love that side of things more almost. Right. But that colder side of Daphne, Bird Box, Carpenter's Farm, and I think Incidents Around the House has balanced that side of things out for me in a way that I'm currently sitting at this sort of like even. It's not that these things are partitioned off from each other, and there's obviously like pearl bleeds over both. Yeah, yeah. But it, it gives the body of work some sort of balance that was that, if you ask me, it was needed. If the whole body of work is a painting, it needed like just one little slash of white, and yeah. incidence is that slash. Huh. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, because now I'm thinking about. So the buy in for me when I first read the really quick description of what it was is like this little girl. Like from her perspective and she's got her parents and she's also got other mommy and other mommy says can I go into your heart that for me was enough to just be so terrifying and it needed to be from Bella's perspective because of what the story is but like, there's something so creepy about when horror interacts with children because their world is different their experience is different and their gauge of what's good or bad is way off But they're like, they're like the representation of innocence too. But like, if there's a, if there's a, an adult in this exact same situation, they've already had bad things happen to them, but they've all already done bad things too. So they're not like blameless. And so like, yeah. when it's a kid that's in the story and they are blameless, it seems extra bad if something bad happens to them, you know? 
So the yes. Stakes, the stakes are different. Well, and I also think, yes, 100%. And I also think that there's like some subconscious thing that's like when you were Bella's age, you believed that something like this was possible. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. if you put the reader in Bella's state of mind and in that age, maybe that and, and now and now it's not two people talking about a book on, over a microphone now it's a, a guy or a girl like reading in their bedroom late at night yeah. so and if you have them in that state of mind that these kind of things are possible and then something in the closet is saying like yeah. do you like me better in here Yeah. like then you're like oh shit you know I, if I read Instance Around the House if I read that when I was 12 I would be like no nope yeah I'm like, no, mom, I can't, I'm, no, I can't read Well, that's read the thing, that's the Jaws thing, like, <laughs> I saw Jaws when I was a kid, we had a pool in my backyard, Yeah. and oh, I was wow, 100% right? convinced that there was a fucking giant shark in this pool that was like 20 feet wide, yeah. it made no sense, but that was real to me, like, yeah. that, was, that was my reality, it was like, that. I know that there's a goddamn shark that's gonna eat me in that thing, so like, yeah, like, it totally makes sense. I, I don't even remember making the decision to... To tell it from Bella's point of view. Oh no, I do. I do remember because no, no, no. I just wrote that first. You know, I don't know if you remember, but the first chapter is real, real short. Yeah, it's like yeah, it's like good night, yeah. mommy, good night, daddo. You know. Yeah, it's like eight it, lines. Yeah, it's like eight lines or whatever. So that's all I wrote first, and then it felt like oh, whatever this is feels good, and then there was no. I wasn't using quotation marks. I wasn't indenting like the action sequences. I wasn't, and it started to feel like even like the format started to feel like maybe a child would have told this because she maybe she would have not known to use quotation marks That's, maybe maybe yeah. like you know the spacing there's a lot of empty space on the pages there's a lot of you know that started to work in my favor also or something it but that really, wasn't like yeah, planned yeah. Yeah. it was like oh this is working this is creating sort of if a kid told a story well it would look different it would be different formatting than if adult an adult did yeah I think that the instinct to do that is good and it worked out great because it was immediately obvious that the formatting was special and it was from the perspective of a child so it's like yeah this is the child's book or whatever right so yeah and really, I, I can see someone online like being like oh I didn't really understand because you know he, he never denotes who's talking or whatever you know I, I can see it. I'm sure there's going to be reviews that are, are like that or whatever that's all fine but I, I really do think like to someone that might think that way is like hold on just pause for one second and think about it that way though that it's an eight-year-old telling you this, and it just an yeah. eight-year-old. It, if, even if she didn't write a book, right? But if she's telling you this, it would look different than if an adult told you that. And, and so I think that adds, yeah. Right, and it's like anybody who's going to complain about that. It's like, well, shit, man, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> they, they will. They will, but it's not like you, as the author, are expected to do one hundred percent of the work for you and me. Right. Like you do. Right. You make the story. And it's up for me to bring along my imagination and my suspension of disbelief. And, well, and, and, yes, and it's up to, I think, it's up to the author, and I think most authors and movie makers think this way nowadays, to trust you. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. it's up to, like, like trust that they're going to get it, man. Yeah. You don't have to, like, everything doesn't have to be so perfectly, you know, you don't have to be like, oh, well, they're not going to know who's talking. Yes, they'll figure it out. Yeah. And, and after, like, a, uh, the first two people that read it, I think, I think maybe it was Clay. Yeah. was like the, one of the first blurbs and I wrote him like hey I just needed to know like did it work like the formatting work for you and he was like he was like oh, two pages in I understood everything the mm. formatting for the rest of the yeah. book I was like great done yeah I would think that maybe if you made it in a more traditional way it would take you away from the perspective of Bella me too and it would make it feel like oh this is an adult trying to write like a kid right and then it's like this makes the story <laughs> Less and, impactful. And, and that does bring up something interesting because it's like there are moments, man, in the rewrite where there are stuff you just don't even notice that you write. Like, mommy sat sat down beside me upon the couch. I'm like, wait, <laughs> yeah. mommy sat down beside me upon the... No, 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 no. Bella wouldn't say right. upon, beside. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah it was like mom, mom's on the couch next to me. Yep. <laughs> or even I'm on the couch, so is mom. Me. Or like, whatever, yeah. It would be yeah. the most simple. Yeah. yeah. Way straighter, yeah. But for that, I was able to Trojan horse in, you know, through Dado and Mommy's monologues, and Ruth's even, I was able to Trojan horse in adult musings. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, so, then, yeah. And I didn't think it was like, che I don't care if it was cheating or not, but I don't think it was cheating because 
Bella doesn't really necessarily understand everything they're saying. It's not like she's yeah. giving us a dissertation on what her, what Dado said. This yeah. is just literally what she heard. So it works. Right, right. right. Yeah, it's what she heard. And our, so that's one of the things that I was thinking about with the story is kids probably usually know more than we give them credit for knowing. And so there was like the moments in the book where the parents are either the zoo fights they go to the zoo and then the parents are standing away from her uh, yeah. at, a, at a distance and that's when they choose to like argue yeah because they think Bella's distracted by what's going on at the zoo <laughs> yeah and Bella's like well we're going to the zoo to, so they can fight yeah and she gets it but they don't get that she gets it and so even though she's a kid and we're seeing this through this like youthful kind of innocent person she understands the adult side of things more than they give her credit for yeah, it's interesting. I wouldn't. I don't know that I would call her precocious. I would say that she's as precocious as probably you or me or, or, or our like close friends were. Or I mean, I don't know. Allison actually really was. I wasn't like that. Not like that. Um, in terms of understanding the adult world or something, I, I wouldn't put her that. Like, but I would say that she or kids in general. Like, I mean, even if you just do you know how people be like the dog knows the kid freaking knows when you guys aren't doing so well or if you guys I mean listen if the dog knows the freaking yeah. eight-year-old kid knows <laughs> and, and like and if I'm walking around a zoo and mommy and dad are like are like kind of like gesturing with their hands behind me you know I'm gonna be like oh man this again these two again you know yeah and I, I wonder like it's weird because dad is like so freewheeling and friendly and optimistic and funny and Bella's best friend, you know? Yep. And Mommy is a little bit edged out. Kind of a lot edged out. She's kind of foot out the door. Kind of foot out the door. Like, yeah. doesn't really... She's one of those people, like, you, you kind of have heard of and maybe not. I've certainly never like, experienced it. Like, a, a person that's almost sees motherhood as something of a prison sentence or right, or, right. A, or a literal chain around her ankle or something and okay that's how she sees it it's funny i when i was writing the, i got i got a note from a friend a reader and i was like these parents are awful you know yeah and i was thinking like no no they're, no no I, I in fact i think dado i could see being a little bit like and, and i think dado's a little like me i could see be a little bothered by him like, they're like, oh, my God, everything's just fine. Everything's just fine. Okay, Dad, yeah. you know, Russ, you know. Like, I get it. But then I can, oh, that's a tree frog. Isn't that sweet? Is that what that is? Yeah, I hope that gets on tape. It kind of sounds, you know what that sounds like? It sounds like like a dinosaur about to lower. It like, really from, does. Yeah. Like, we're in Jurassic Park or something <laughs> <Yes>. right now. <laughs> that's amazing. It sounds like one of those things, and it's going to come come land on you. Wow. That's, that's really cool. Yeah, so, it's like but, right there. But the point is, like, just of this, I guess, moment is... I don't dislike mommy. Right. I really don't. I'm like, she's okay. Maybe she's not cut out for motherhood. And we're definitely catching her at a weird moment in her life. Oh, boy. But, and I can see her years later, like, being a little, like, more like, oh, boy, I was going through something. I don't know, though. I think I'd probably rather drink with Dado. I think mommy would be a heavy conversation or edgy. <laughs> but, but I don't dislike her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Here's the question that I'm trying to think if it's going to spoil stuff so if it we'll cut it or whatever we'll cut it mid tree frog so everybody <laughs> knows there's a cut remember mid tree frog i almost got the sense that other mommy so there's two two thoughts here either other mommy was drawn to the strife in the family and that was like i think maybe other mommy saw when the family wasn't doing so great this was my opportunity to swoop in and try and make the daughter feel okay about, can I go into your heart? And because it seemed like the other mommy moments were ramped up when there was more chaos going on in the family. For sure. That could have just been, that was, okay, cool. Well, I don't know. But then there was also No, that, there's no question that observation is, is true. Yeah. That, 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 her, she ramps up the, the more chaos in the family, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. And, and you could you could argue there's more cast because she ramped up, but no, not really. Like the Frank right. thing and this thing, like that was happening either way. Right. Right. Yes. So, yep. but I, yeah, I, I think that there's, I think it's unavoidable that parallel or something, right? Is that Bella's parents' marriage is falling apart? Yep. And 
something, and something that she at least calls other mommy has arrived. Well, and is here to ask for an invitation, really. It's saying, can I go into your heart? Yep. And so, ye, there, that's not that's not a coincidence. Like, other yeah. mommy must. It's funny, I'm answering as if I don't know for sure. <laughs> but it's like, I, I would guess that she, in where, wherever she is, or it, sorry, really, it's an it. <laughs> wherever it is, sensed. This is my chance. This is a chance right there. Yeah. 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 Because it wasn't. This kid needs a friend. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. Because when the parents, so the the thing that I thought was really authentic about the parents squabbling and and everything and trying to make the kid okay, is that they totally miss the point of what the kid needs, and they just try to placate. Everything's okay. Everything's okay. We're not having trouble. Obviously, they're having trouble. Obviously, like, they're having trouble. So instead of yeah, instead of doubling down on being good parents they're just kind of like ah, don't worry about it yeah everything will be fine yeah even though they don't believe. and dad was even like that yeah right and he's like the coolest guy or whatever dad was an interesting one man I got I, I just I told you earlier I just feel like saying it on tape too is that he's just one of the most fluid characters I've ever written sometimes you'll have a character where you don't need to even think what they would say what they would talk about like is that him is that her you know in the new book I'm working on I'm, there's, I'm totally worried about that shit with this one woman <laughs> and what with Dado and Mallory and a few others it's, it's just been like nope that's I don't need to rewrite a single word you're saying Dado is real fluid for me I, that's exactly how I react oh my like, god me too yeah, totally <laughs> that guy. there's that one moment where, oh, where, where Dado gives his gives like the differences between being startled shook mm -hmm, afraid mm -hmm, yeah. and then it's like we say scared for all these things but are we scared every time or is it just like you were startled this time you were because yeah. they're very different things are you are you actually scared right now or are you something else and you're calling it scared right somewhere in there she he says something like I know things must be really hard for you right now and then it cuts to her narration she goes oh I know I just know that he's about to like try to make me feel better and his next line is but I think we're really going to get through this. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> and it's like that moment encapsul encapsulates like that's the Dado experience. Yeah. And that's why you could kind of see like, all right, dude. Okay. But like, this is freaky. And he definitely mm -hmm. knows that. But like, like he would like, almost feel better if he finally let himself lose his shit. <laughs> yeah. You almost like, want Dado to like, just like punch a hole in the wall. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, you know, like, what you're, yeah, it, it crosses the, the boundary <laughs> from being, the guy who wants to be calm and in control to being the guy who's just in total denial about what's going on. Yeah, and right, then that, right. that's a useless person. So, like, what we need is someone who's right. useful. Yeah, yeah. And he's looking up ghost hunters online and all yeah. that and all that whole <laughs> sequence and Ursula's like, oh my God, what are we doing, you know? So, talking about... That, so, like, like we said, early in the book, everybody pretty much knows that this thing is real. Yeah. That other mommy. And so they try and start finding... Uh, solutions to this how do we get rid of this thing but really is it how do we get rid of this thing or how do we protect our daughter or is it kind it of it does feel like more how do we, we get rid of this thing yeah. which is interesting yeah because it doesn't that is interesting because it's not like they're like we're going to put Bella over here at Ruth's house and we'll stay at home and face this thing yeah that they don't that that's never really the case <laughs> but they're also like horrified to leave her alone yeah yeah because I mean if if after what they saw, like, I mean, we can't leave her alone somewhere. Yeah, we know? gotta, like... Yeah, 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 yeah. We gotta circle the wagons. Yeah, yeah, kind of thing. <laughs> for sure. Oh, my God. Yeah. If I saw that thing with my kid, I, I literally might tie my kid's hand to my yeah. mind. Yeah. Like, till we sorted this out. Yeah. Like, you, I, might, you, I would definitely sleep with the kid tied to me. Like, you, literally. You'd I mean, go, I would... You'd go Mallory. You would, like... Yes. Yep. Every every possible... Wow, that's an interesting instinct. thing. Yeah. That you just pointed out, is that Bird Box also has that quote unquote reality or that realism and what what that realism is is not the scenario it's but it's Mallory's reaction to the scenario yeah yep. I didn't even think about that that's interesting yeah. that the both of those have that yeah but I, the thing that I thought was refreshing we talked about this earlier was nobody fucking knows what to do nobody and they they go to who would be the experts they go to the, a priest they don't even make it inside the building right? no like with the, with the they're like no sorry uh, <laughs> um, and then they go to like the ghost hunter is probably one of my favorite moments because sweet oh man that's awesome and I don't know if we can say what happens with the ghost hunter but um, no yeah. I guess we can't no that's a spoiler <laughs> no but like 
yeah, just watching them try every single avenue and like losing hope as they go along. But also, I think the interesting thing is, I think that that's where Ursula, mommy, kind of bounces back a little yeah, bit. Yeah, definitely. Because she's like, fuck this. Uh, everybody's failing us. Yeah. We got to, it's up to us to figure this out. Yeah, but that like, when, she, when like, they're out on the lawn after the whatever, yeah. and she's like, we have to do that. We, yeah. we actually have to do this, you and me. Yeah, us. but like, she gains strength in that moment. Yeah. She still doesn't know what she's doing, but like, she's like, <laughs> doubled down and resolved. Do you remember the scene where they're like, getting ready for what comes next? Like, where they're taking a shower, like trading in the shower. Yes. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that, that, that was, was a, that for me, when I was right now, I was like, oh my God, that felt really realistic to me too, because it would be like, to have gone through all that is like we're gonna face this. It's like, all right, like let's uh, you know let's let's prepare for battle or whatever the phrase yeah. might be. Let's 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 get ready. Oh my god, we're doing this. You yeah. know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good stuff. Uh, what else can we say? What else can we talk about it? Um, right, because it's a little hard because of spoilers, right? Yeah. Um, it's weird because in a way the whole book is made up of spoilers in a way. Because even the fact that like they see it isn't yeah. on page one, and it really matters that they see it and how they react. But I mean, at some point, we got to be able to talk about something, right? So, yeah, right. <laughs> the, so, all right, so I'll read. We talked about the priests. Those were the priests I know, and that was the sounds they make walking away from us. It sounded like the whole world walked away from us. Oh man! Holy crap! And that's that's from Bella's perspective. Like that's a kid thinking that. Yeah, it feels like yeah. the whole world because it was like they'll be able to help us, yeah. and and they, they didn't even they didn't even go to the house to check it out. Yeah, they didn't even ask Bella a question. Yeah, they're just like mommy and Ruth go in to talk to them. I can only imagine that conversation. I can only imagine what mommy was like, and and they walk out like oh my god, they said no, and the priests are like walking up the street. Yep. It's almost like they give Bella one look of like almost like, I don't know, almost sympathy. Yeah. But then the question is, did the priest say no because they know? Because they believe something bad's there? Because or, they know they can't do anything about right. what's that, there. That's what I, um, I that's they, a great question. Or do they say no because they're not interested in getting involved? I, I think they say no because they're like, they don't believe it and they, yeah. they're not interested in getting involved. But it is... It's fun to think about that other way too. Yeah, yeah. Where they're like, uh, they're like, we're not the person that you need. <laughs> that would be really. Cool. We actually can't help you with <laughs> yeah. this. It sounds real. We have no idea how to help you with this, <laughs> right? But you can feel like, I think when they choose not to help, you can feel that betrayal either way. I oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's religion can't help. A cult, it mom, dad, grand family, friends. That scene where they're at Amanda and Dan's, and then Amanda and Dan are like, "Hey guys, uh, you know," I, uh, and they're like, "Come on, you're not you're not telling us to leave, are you?" And they're like, "Listen, yeah. man, you're really freaking us out." And it's like, "Oh, dude, <laughs> you're gonna make us go." But I don't know if you remember in that scene, he thought that he saw um, Amanda upstairs. Did you catch that? Because Dan's like, you know, I thought I saw Amanda like crying upstairs or whatever, but she wasn't up there um. at that moment. Uh, and you're like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, what is going on in this house, too? Yep. So I was talking to my friend James on the phone when I was writing it, James Hall, and I was like, he's like, so what, what is this one about? What's it called and what's it about? And I'm like, I don't know what it's called, but, but so far it's just a series of incidents around the house. And I was like, oh, that's it. Yep. That's it. That's the title. That's the title. And he was like, yeah, great. And then I actually kind of, I, I don't need to get too deep into it, but I actually, I actually had to fight for the title. No kidding. Which is which is somewhat rare. I think huh. I've only had to do that a couple of times in my career, but this one I had to fight for. It. And I was like, no, no, this is no, this is good. Did yeah, you, this one stays. Well, I'm glad it stayed because otherwise we wouldn't have come up with interviews around that. Yeah. <laughs> but did you did you get pitched like other titles and stuff? Or I did, but I, I don't want to embarrass them by telling you what they are because <laughs> it was it was they weren't great. Yeah. But like I love them who pitch them I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be politically correct I do love them like adore them but it just I, it was one of those things where sometimes as a horror author and you have horror in your bones you just know it's you know it's right you know yeah. it's gonna work when Bird Box when we were first chopping Bird Box Kristen my agent said to me just so you know likely we're gonna have to change this title like it doesn't mean anything like what does Bird Box mean right yeah, yeah, like yeah. it doesn't tell anyone anything and I was like, but I just knew. I'm like, no, it's yeah. right. It's like, 
is an impression. It's an, you know, it, it actually does, if you read the book, make sense. And, and same thing with incidents around the house. It just felt exactly right for what it is. Because obviously, there's the incidents around the house with other mommy, and there's the incidents around the house between Russ and her. Between the, right. Yeah, the, the family, or the parents. So then I'm thinking about, I was wondering if it was like a once bitten, twice shy kind of thing, because you said that Pearl should have just stayed on this the day of the pig at some point. So he, Well, but that one was me. Right. That, that okay. was my mistake. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like so, Pearl, though. I, I don't I, I, no, I, You know what? I do, too. And uh, I think it was Ryan Clark. You know Ryan Clark from Gibson's in New Hampshire? Or, yeah, in New Hampshire. Um, oh, God, Ryan Clark. You got to meet her, man. She is the best, man. And she said the same thing, that she really liked the name Pearl. And it made me feel like, okay, fine, fine. Maybe I should. But we, we were putting it out wider. I don't know. It just, like... It seemed like, oh, that we should title it something different or something. I, I, yeah. I went through this stupid moment where I was like, but I do like Pearl, though. Well, I mean, it's probably rare that you get a chance to have two iterations yeah. of the same thing. But yeah. Pearl, the fucking cover for Pearl is fantastic. The U.S. cover, I don't know if it's different in... The little drawn the, farmhouse thing? Yeah. So, I didn't draw that, but that whole thing was my idea. Yeah. Where I sent them a white piece of paper, and it said Pearl with, like, a red, like, barn drawing... I think it looks insane. I have it at my desk somewhere. <laughs> and I sent them a photo. I'm like, can you do something like this? And yeah. they, the first thing they sent back was that. And I was like, oh my God, this is perfect. It's so good. I love it. It's, it's just, yeah. it's so simple. And, yeah. and to me, that represents the day Pearl starts to recognize that, you know, what he can do. Right. So like you have this little line, line drawing that's like just starting to, Yep. it's like brick one of the, in a super elaborate painting to come. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's such a good book. Yeah. Pearl. Thank you. Pearl was one. Yeah. Pearl was one that was like, y- you, I think we talked about it earlier, not being recorded about like the different kind of, I don't want to say quadrants or whatever, but like some of your books are more like this. Some of your books are more like yeah. this. And Pearl really felt like down and dirty, just really horror like just yeah. like horror for the sake of being horror if that makes sense yes for sure yeah I feel like Pearl Daphne Daphne um, oh man I yeah. think Incidents Around the House touches that where it just feels like because some people would be like you know Bird Box is more of a thriller or it's more sci-fi and no, I'm like no that's a horror novel dude but with Pearl you can't even have that conversation and, and yeah, I love that no I love that yeah, yeah. so, so I'm, I want to talk about Other Mommy because like the idea of Other Mommy is the thing I think that made it scary for me in the book was how you didn't have a real clear picture of what you were actually seeing because it wasn't always the same. Right. Um, did that kind of just took all of us sort of on, or did you have a really good idea about what other mommy was going to be presented as? I know like, I had a good idea on this one. Yeah. yeah, like I saw it as like it must have. Long, longish hair enough for Bella to have considered it other mommy, but but <coughs> once you understand that, like, and if this is a spoiler, oh well. But like I was telling you, my favorite line of the movie or the book is when mommy says the dad, because she saw it first. She's like, it wasn't a woman, and the reason she felt compelled to say that is because. Bella calls it other mommy. Yeah. So dad, I was like, did, what was she like? Did she, and she's like, stop saying she, it wasn't a woman, but also it wasn't a man. Also it wasn't, you know what I mean? What she saw is like, it's not us, man, you yeah. know? And so, <laughs> and so I had a sense from the beginning that like, yeah. And that depending on what mood she's in, she, see, it's hard, it's impossible yeah. not to call her that. Um, <laughs> depending on what mood it, she's in, her eyes might both be on one side of her face or at the bottom of her face and her mouth's up here or like it's almost like, like it's this. almost like other mommies like not exactly quite sure how to mimic a person yeah that's the feeling I got so like yeah. things are a little bit like off and wrong in a weird way yeah. <laughs> like like yeah yep. like okay so that was like it was like an alien trying to like present as like a thing or, or like a, de- yeah. a demon an otherworldly thing yeah making its best approximation of yeah what a pizza you almost person. imagine you know the moments where she apes someone else she mimics someone else right yeah. and you almost imagine if you got like a real close look you'd be like oh god that's a really bad 
Yeah. Right. But from across the room or from behind, it worked. Yep. But if I actually like walked in front of you, like I'd be like, oh, that's not mom. That's, right. that's, that's not what you look like. Yeah. Or that's not what Calvin looks like. Or that's not what, you know. Yeah. But so it was almost like the entity like pulled off just enough to like fool someone or something like that. Yeah. Especially if it's a kid, especially if it's in the dark yeah, or whatever. Exactly. Like, right. The, yeah. Enough to. Or the parted clothes of a closet and you see like, you know, something that looks like your, your brother looking out at you or something. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I read most of this book so in my empty apartment late at night when there was like I have the people that live above me and they have weird hours because one of them I think is like a bartender or something and so like a lot of the book I was reading was just you know, my, my apartment is almost totally silent all the time I don't have any pets or anything and I'm reading this and like there's creaks it's a building there's creaks <laughs> and I'm, I look to my closet and you know like it's just a natural thing like it really sucks you up into the feeling of of that thing yeah yeah for sure yeah I wrote it I don't know if I said it on here yet but I said it to you before that usually I'm always writing soundtracks did I say that on here I don't yeah. think so I didn't no, you okay I usually write the soundtracks and finally for the first time ever I was like hey write a book to silence and the book was written the sessions were like eight at night till like midnight. Yeah. So it was like the house was dark, <laughs> the house was silent. We have cats that you so you'd hear like little little footsteps, a little pattering throughout the house in the distance. And I'm writing in the dark of the office with just the bathroom light on and the computer obviously glowing, which means on the other side of the computer it looks dark to me because the computer's in my face. Right, because it's blinding you. And out there's a closet there. right over there. And I mean, <laughs> I started to get freaked out, man. I. <laughs> I would leave the office and go find Allison, and I would just be like, hey, how are you? Like, what are you doing, you know? What are you, what are you up to? And she's like, are you freaked out right now? I'm like, oh, no, 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 I just, I'm just wondering what you're doing. And I'm like standing like in the bathroom, you know, with my, you know, without my back to the door, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. That's awesome. The uh, Evelyn Goblin scene. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. The bathroom scene there. I don't want to spoil anything, but... I after I wrote that scene, I got up and left the office for a while. Yeah, that so yeah, that was a very effective, creepy, fucking scary moment. But that also brought something up. I mentioned it when we were driving around earlier, which could be a spoiler. Was Bella and how she was concerned about if the the grown ups saw other mommy, like how it would affect them. Yeah, yeah. That's not, that's not a spoiler. No, right? I don't no. think so. No. No, in fact, I think that adds, like, so much to this conversation, too, because it's, I guess that is a bit precocious for her to be thinking that way, but, but, right, what that also indicates is that how much she must have been changed to think this is going, like, like Dad's different now, Dado's different now, he saw it, yep. he saw their mommy, Mommy's different now, she saw their mommy, Grandma Ruth, Evelyn, you know, all these things, and I guess if that's a little spoiler, anyway, whatever, I hope, just pretend you didn't hear that stuff, people. <laughs> and and it's like, yeah, like that that concept where it's like almost like that's more like that's like scarier or sadder or something than anything else in the book is that these people are changed now, unwillingly. Yeah, you know I mean, I guess and and anything could change you, right? Like if Allison broke up with me suddenly today, I'd be changed unwillingly, right? And that's a natural thing. But this is an unnatural thing <laughs> that, like, for now on, I mean, I mean how can Dad? Oh, how can mommy? How can any character? How can Marcia from the party, like, ever just like go to a regular go to a party again and just feel regular? Like, how can you even go anywhere again? Imagine Marcia home alone after that, after what she saw. Yeah, she's gonna have to go through lots of therapy. You know, yeah, like, she's gonna have to go through therapy, man. Yeah. Or just complete denial. Like, you might just shut it down. Like, yeah. Oh, that was, you know, I had that was a party gag or what was that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but then Bella being however old Bella is, like seven or eight years old or something. Eight, yeah. Eight years old. Ha and having the presence of mind to think, that must mean she knows that because I've been interacting with other mommy, I'm different. Right. And if that happens to these people, they will be different too. And she must not be happy or proud of the change in herself to be worried about it. So that's really, like, sobering in a way. Yes. Like, I mean, the book is like, this is a... Sometimes I feel like it, it, that it's a mean book. It's like it's cold. There's like a wind that blows through this book that I felt the whole time, and I like the whole time I was like, "Do not close the windows. Like let that wind blow through this book the whole time. Never cross over into 
don't be funny because you feel like you need some sort of comic relief. Like, oh my God, don't, don't, uh, try not to lose this, like, one, that, that sort of pulse behind it, that rhythm, that one note of dread that you said Bird Box has too. Like, just try, like, very aware of, like, keeping the atmosphere of that book through the mm. entire thing. And if some, if an idea even sort of threatened that atmosphere, like, then don't write it. Well, there was one of the things that I think was good was there was a couple of moments where they think, all right, we got through this. And then, you know, like, so they, the, when they put Evelyn and Goblin, so like, that was cool too. Like, Goblin shows up. Yeah, they went, they went around Goblin for the day. Yeah. yeah. And then, but that's weird too because they're going around Goblin and they're like, Ruth and Grandma um, and Dano and, and Mommy are like asking people. I don't know if you caught that, if you remember, like, while, while Bell is, like, playing Arcadian or whatever, like, the, the adults are, like, yeah. asking people for, like, help or, yep. or, like, a cult. Yeah, they're like, trying to find... They're trying to find help. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we had desperately and kind of weirdly... And yeah. Like, With, like, like, no were, idea what else to do. Yeah, like, they were begging on the street. Yeah, like, yeah. they were begging on the street for, rather than for money, for help dealing with this entity in their house. Yeah. And you figure you might be able to find that again. <laughs> Last ditch effort. Like, let's see if a bigger monster can take care. Yeah, of Yeah, that'd be funny if they <laughs> if they ran into Walter Camp, who's afraid of being like horrified of being scared to death. Yeah. Can you help us, sir? We have this thing in our house. You would die. <laughs> he just dies. <laughs> <laughs> if Walter Camp saw their mommy, he would he would his head would explode. That would be, that would be it. <laughs> We're cool though because it was almost like uh, at least they're trying to like lie to themselves that that they're that they're in the clear. You know, yeah, for a night. And that doesn't last. And the whole time you're kind of like, if you're like, because they're starting to drink and they, they need to blow off steam, man. This has been the most intense however many days it's been. And I mean, the lives. Although, remember, at first, at that moment, Dado hadn't seen it. Yeah, that's true. You know? He didn't understand. He, 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 he believed Ursula, but it's like, but, so like, they start blowing off steam and you're just reading that like, oh no, oh no. Oh, guys, guys, it was like a ticking time bomb. Like, guys, what are you doing? Like, maybe one drink? What are you guys doing? They're getting, like, hammered. They got real hammered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there was that cute moment where, like, I won't say what happened afterward, but Bella just needed to use the bathroom, but there was no one else awake to, like, escort her. Yeah. And so it's like, what do I do? Do I just pee? She, she looks in the closet. Can I just pee in the closet? Yeah. Which, yeah. which understanding everything that came before that. Yeah. The closet is like the least safe space. Yeah, the, in like theory or whatever. So yeah, that was cool. That she was, like what? She, what did she look for? Like a bowl or a, or a shoe in there or something? something yeah. yeah, she was like maybe there's like a bowl, so I don't gotta leave this room. Yeah. Oh, you could really imagine like you could just really imagine it like opening that door and you can see like you're that age and like the wood floors that and the bathrooms up that way and like Evelyn and, and Ruth are sleeping up that way and like. I can make it to the bathroom and back. Right, right, you're doing like math, like kid math. Like, yeah, yeah. Can I do this? I can do this. You yeah. know, when I was uh, a kid, this is a sad story, but my grandma had like Alzheimer's and she would, um, I went to a grocery store with my mom and my grandma and my grandma was carrying around a, a like a doll that she thought was real. Oh, yeah. And so she was like talking to the whole time we were at the grocery store and I'm like, it was just me, my mom, and my grandma had this doll and she was carrying it around and talking to it like as if it was real and and then I'm, I'm like 10 or however years old and that night I woke up in bed and I had to use the bathroom at my grandma's and I went and I'm going down the hall and I look to my left and I swear to god the doll she had like set it up sitting in a chair in the freaking extra bedroom or something and I I just ran back to the bedroom to my room I didn't go to the bathroom I was like I, I could because all day grandma was talking to it as if it was real right and then it's just sitting there. And then it's just sitting there in this chair. Oh, and I was like, oh boy. I was like, I can't. I just ran back into the room. Good Lord, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so there was some feeling there remembering that of Bella opens the door and like, you know, the kid math that you said. Totally, yeah. man. Can I get there and back? Oh, and then remember she sees the, the sort of discoloration behind the shower curtain? Yeah. And she's like yeah. talking to what, Evelyn or something, I think? She called out to her grandmother, I think, and, was it and to, to Evelyn, I think. Yeah, okay, yeah. To see who, if someone was there. Yeah, right. And yeah. we, and at that point, I, at that point, we're like, someone's there. 
Yeah. And then, but then, you know, whatever. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mentioned this when we were talking earlier today. There was two cool, like, trick of your mind moments that I thought were really effective. One where, like, because, like, other mommy manifesting sometimes is, like, a little thing that gets bigger and bigger. They're at a gas station and someone's scrubbing their window with the window squeegee thing and the water and the soap on the on the window yeah. looks like it could be a face and there was like this kind of like ambiguity about it yeah like, the more you look at it the scarier it gets and the, like the water is moving so the eyes are moving and stuff yeah and then the other one was there was at one point they were by a body of water and it's like is that wave not moving right like, right that like that's like, what yeah. it was right yeah because when you it brought like, it up earlier i'm like is that what it was yeah yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. so like even if definitively you told me right now, oh no, that was just their their, eye, their eyes playing games on them, still as scary as if it was actually other mommy. Yes, you know, definitely. Yeah. yeah, the one in the gas station, I I I, I was way into. Yeah, because I was, I was, I'm like, she's thinking. I think she was thinking about the early days, because everyone else is asleep. She's thinking about you know when other mommy would start saying. Remember that part about. You don't want me out, standing outside the door meowing like Pester, you know? Mm. Oh, you know what? You know what you need to hear on this podcast? You need to hear Allison's <laughs> rendition of Other Mommy's voice. Oh, you're kidding me. This, so she, yeah, oh, yeah. That's awesome. Okay, listeners, I'm <coughs> I'm currently calling Allison to bring her outside to do the voice of Other Mommy. Why are you calling me? Because we, <laughs> you're requested on the podcast... What? You are requested on the podcast to do your other mommy voice. Um, I gotta, I gotta practice it. Okay, practice it. <laughs> but then come over and do it. She's going to do this for the reading. And the first time she did it, we were like, holy shit. Yeah. Yeah, like I, I wish that she could do it for the audio book for, for Del Rey, but I, I don't think I just don't know how that works or if it could work. I could I could ask them, but um, I guess I could ask them. But it was just extraordinary. All of us in the reading were like looking at each other, like this is perfect. Yeah, yeah, it's weird, man. She seems like she has a good grasp of like your vision in a way, like when it translates into other things. So like obviously you've got your words on your page, but like she helps a lot with the. Live readings and like the costuming oh, and the yeah and the sets and everything and it's always it seems like she always really gets the vibe you're going for. Am I accurate with that? Oh yeah, one of the most wild experiences of my life. Me and Christy, Christy who helps narrate. She actually Christy is playing Bella, like narrating Bella in this one. And so Christy and I are at this podium or whatever for Goblin, mm. and the first scene is Walter Camp in the reading we did. I don't know if you remember, Walter's a really big dude, mm -hmm. and he's like sleeps on the glass bed so that nothing can be hiding under the bed and anything. Right, right. So she made that bed. That bed is out on the stage. <laughs> but where's Allison? And we don't we don't know. She's not here yet. She's not at the library, and the gig is starting in minutes. And Christy and I are like, I don't know what to do, man. I think we just got to just read the scene without her, you know. And we're standing there, and so it's dark in the room. Everyone's seated in the room. I mean, we're talking minutes, and the, we could see, like, through this back, from where we were standing, you could see through this backstage area where <laughs> we were. And I, I look back there, and with, like, two minutes to go, I see a giant guy, like, with a with his, in his pajamas with, like, a blanket, like, walk by that, like, little view that I had. And I was like, <laughs> Allison is not only here. I hadn't seen any of this, but she is 100%, like, dressed up as Walter Camp. Yeah. Like a hundred percent. I had not seen it like the short I can show you a photo. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And yeah, and then she walked right out right when Christy and I started and sat on the bed and started performing and it was like one of the most genius things I've ever seen else to do. Wow. Yeah. That's, she that's she also in the Daphne reading, that one begins so we did that one in a gymnasium. That was awesome. Everyone was in like the stands. Right, right. And I'm reading from the Spirit of Sam Hatton, this, like, rock that all the kids sign in town. And it opens with 
Kit making this free throw, but she asks the rim a question as she shoots. You know, is Daphne going to get me? That kind of thing. Yep. In the rehearsal the night before, I'm facing the empty stands and Allison is Kit. And I'm like, and then she shoots and I hear the clang, you know, and I'm like, ah, fuck, you know. She missed it, who cares? <laughs> and then the next day I say to her, like, you know, take that shot. And she goes, of course, what do you mean? I was like, okay, okay, okay. And then the night of, man, I'm reading to a hundred people in the gym and it's dark and fog and Allison's at the free throw line, like holding the ball like this for like while I'm talking forever. And then I was like, and it leaves her fingers. And then I hear her go, swish. And I was like, oh. and the whole gym went, oh. <laughs> and I was like, Allison just made that shot while I was r- narrating it. That's I mean, talk about ballsy. Talk about clutch. Yeah. A dude is narrating you making a 10, whatever, I don't know, what is it, free throw, 15 feet? Whatever it is, 10, I can't remember right now. Um, narrating you making that shot, and he, she made it in front of everyone. Oh, it was gorgeous, dude. Was oh, great. that's so beautiful. I know. It's so perfect. So yeah. she, yeah, she's been, I mean, she was, you know, Nurse Allen in Black Man Wheel. She was... Smoke in I'm Mary Carol. She was DAD in uh, Inspection. She yeah, she's done yeah all this all this shit. She did the art for the Earthling yep. Goblin yep. book, right? Yeah, that's yeah. what the that's what the painting is. Did you see the Goblin yeah. painting? That's what that is. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, I always thought, and this is just me maybe being dumb, but like I always had a suspicion that you used her silhouette for Daphne the cover of Daphne no it just looks exactly like her it's, no I know yeah. when the, the first time they sent that to me I'm like this is crazy like this I don't know how this worked that it's it's equal parts like it works for Daphne and Allison <laughs> yeah it's, and I was like for whatever reason it would just make sense because she seems like she's so kind of ingrained in your creative process that, yeah, like, yeah. like that you could have taken that picture and was like hey can we do something like this and they're just like let's do it oh no, yeah that did it I know it's crazy it, it looks so much it's yeah. not like the same like, like the structure of the and, face yeah 100% yeah. even the hair like yeah. it, it works I know I, I really does I, she agree with that uh yeah I think so yeah I think so yeah that's wild yeah Daphne's cover is really good I, I love oh my god I love that one I didn't they didn't send me anything else that was like they said that I was like we're done yeah they're like no don't you want to see I was like no 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 we're done Awesome. Yeah. To it and everything. Yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah, I was going to make some jokes at Allison. But that Pearl was also based on Aunt Allison. But no, that's a, no. <laughs> no, I like the thing about the cover being like, here's my rough idea, and they just made it. Yes. They just made it great. I know. Yeah. That was totally, that was amazing yeah. for me, man. I was like, really? You guys, okay, you took that idea? Sweet. I just <laughs> like, I'm just like thinking about incidents like, in terms of like, it's, it's a hard one to know, like what comes next, right? Because like, okay, Daphne, we were talking about is like horror, and then Spin a Black Yarn is like an amalgamation of things, but it does have half thousands on it. It does have Argyle, like some real moments, so yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And but it is more expansive. Then Incidents Around the House is really tightly horror again, and it's interesting to think like. Not strategically, but just like atmospherically, mood wise, what follows this book? Yeah. You know? I wrote a nonfiction book at Delray. Speaking of scaring incidents, um here's uh here's another mommy to, to weigh in on. Bella, can I go into your heart, please? Let me in, Bella, Bella. <laughs> it's so oh good. That's like, wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. I got the chills again. It's like, that's like what we were talking about. Other mommy approximating what someone might look like. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. other mommy approximating what language might be. Like sound, yeah. Yeah. Like there's like a little tremor in the voice. No, and it's just like and it's, it's like, like atonal. Like it doesn't know where a sentence lands. Stretched out. And yeah. Everything. That's really uh, good. I can't yeah. even do it. I mean, so she did that in our first rehearsal, and for some, it's funny. Allison always plays the monster. You know, <laughs> smoke. D A D. Rot. She also played Rot in Carol, and it's funny because she's a beautiful woman and, and a brilliant artist and could narrate the whole thing and whatever. But 
she, we all knew we were like, well, Allison's playing other mommy, right? She has to, you know, because mm-hmm. she's the one that can slither out on her belly from a closet, and she's the <laughs> one that can talk like this. And but none of us were expecting when she was like, in that voice, "Do you like me better in here?" But in that what you just heard, and we were all like, "Oh, oh, that's it! You just nailed it!" Like that atonal, yeah, approximation of speaking. I can see why you would want that on the audiobook. Yeah, I know. Like. I know. I'm yeah. thinking about talking to them about that, like sending them this and be it's, like, "It's not unprecedented, like, for authors to be involved in their own, yeah, stuff, or like the, like in this case, it, I can see it being like a gigantic hassle for them, but also not really. Why? Because how many lines does other mommy really have? Right, and it's and like some of them are the same thing. And and and, and when, uh, well, that's a spoiler. Um, there are times where she would be using someone else's voice. Right. So right. Mean, Allison doesn't have to do those. Yeah. Right. So we just need the, do you like me better in the closet? Can I go into your heart? Yeah. That's the, uh, you don't want me to be like pester. Yeah. Like upset. Lines, yeah, it would be like 20, 30 lines. Yeah. And so that is a possibility. I just need to tell them. Yeah, I would add. This is that. exceptional what Allison <coughs> has presented during this reading. Mm-hmm. And it could elevate the entire experience of the mm-hmm. audiobook. So I yeah. just need to tell them that. I'll, I'll write them that tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that's that is very impressive stuff. <laughs> <laughs> she just came right out and did it, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh. That's one of the great things about Wild Town is there's some, like, real, like, just, like, almost shameless performers like James Henry Hall. I swear if we were like, hey, man, we're all doing it naked, he would do it. And then if he was the only one that showed up naked, he wouldn't care. He'd be like, all right, well, fuck it, I'm going to do it naked. <laughs> and Allison uh, doing all these... I remember we were all so nervous before the Daphne one. I don't know, know why exactly. We were all so nervous. And Allison was like, guys, we're just doing a book reading. Yeah. And it was like, okay. It's and for, then we, for anybody that's listening, Wild Town is the performers who do the live events. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so sorry. Yeah, Wild Town is a group of us that put on these theatrical readings of the books. Yeah. And Lily is just like, you know, and I'm like, it's, it's just interesting. It's like a bunch of personalities that are like screw it man let's do it you know yeah yeah it's that's good awesome. yeah i yeah you had you had announced so the one that for incidents around the house is gonna happen at the end of may no june. At the end of june mm-hmm. and i'm like i could make the drive back up for that yeah so, yeah <laughs> it could be fun yeah. you can um, stay here again so going back to the nonfiction book, it's almost like maybe a palate cleanser. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Right, right. So like if we have like a career arc or whatever, it seems like a very good time to be like, okay, you know what? Nonfiction. Yeah. Because pause like this, let let incidents around the house, the mood like dissipate or something. The the, on the nonfiction book, by the way, real fast, is because I don't want anyone to it's hilarious to imagine me having done any research. It's about um, like this unbelievable profound night that Allison and I had twelve years ago. Oh, right, right, in which right. Allison had never seen the movie Evil Dead. Mm-hmm. And so, I guess I'm really just giving everything away right now. It's called Watching Evil Dead. <laughs> and it's the night that Allison sees it for the first time. And we watched it with this other couple. And Allison and I were just new to each other. And I just got a book deal. So it was this exciting new, like, oh my God, moment. And we were watching it with a couple that I think it was their last night together ever. Like, they, like, hated each other. Yeah. So it was this incredible night of young love, dying love, of standing in the precipice of, like, a, of a career in art, watching a movie, like, their first movie. This is my first book. Like, so many giant questions. Yeah. And we're all, like, getting drunk and high and, like, crazy, like, discussing all these things. And, and it's, I mean, it's a 220-page book or whatever. And when I was done, I mean, I was just like, I'm not going to find anyone to put this out. I don't care at all. Just I wanted to have a cool cover, and if it gets in stores, that would be amazing. And Kristen, I sent it to Kristen, my agent, and I was nervous because I'm like, she's going to be like, the hell is this, Josh? <laughs> it's literally a book of you guys just hanging out for a night and talking. And, uh, and then right after I sent it to her, I was like, you know what? I think Kristen's going to like this because this is a book about writing and falling in love with writing and, and falling in love with like this whole thing I actually, and she loves books and so Kristen calls me soon after she's like I, this was great mm-hmm. like I, I love it I'm, I'm, I'm going to shop this to Del Rey da, da, da. I'm like really? and then she's <laughs> like we got to temper our expectations Del Rey I don't even know if they do this kind of thing and Del Rey made an offer already they read it and made an offer so 
Okay. So watching Evil Dead is maybe that is the right follow up to yeah. incidents like something a palate cleanser, like you said. Well, and it times kind of not simultaneously, but like near to the documentary stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 